for the last part of this um, lesson, we're going to focus on sort of predator um, prey relationships. So here um, we have a graph that shows sort of time versus the number of gazelles and lions. So in case you um, don't know, lions um, eat gazelle. Gazelle is sort of like a deer. Um, so if we sort of look at this um, graph, we'll see when the amount of gazelle spikes, the amount of lions also spike because there's now food for them. Um, but then when the amount of lions spike, the amount of gazelle go down. So there's sort of like a delayed effect between sort of the spiking of the gazelle and the spiking of the lions. It's sort of a, a delay in time to some extent. And this cycle sort of continues. Um, in this sort of equilibrium here, the gazelle go up, lions go up, and then in, in, in response, the gazelle go down. There's sort of an equilibrium relationship that's, that exists between the gazelle um, and the lions, and eventually, you know, like after the lions go down, the gazelles rebound, and then it continues, the cycle sort of continues. But there's sort of an equilibrium amount that are present here for a gazelle, and then here for lions, and this equilibrium um, sort of keeps the community stable. Um, the problem is, though, if for some reason, I don't know, let's say there was some sort of disease that wiped out the gazelle, then the lions would have nothing to eat and then the lions would go down in population. Um, so sort of their, this sort of relationship is dependent on keeping the community stable. Um, similarly, for some reason, the amount of lions spiked um, here, then the gazelle would go down. Um, and then the things that they eat the gazelle would not have any food. Um, so this sort, of, is this, this sort of relationship, this cycle relationship between predator, predator and prey um, is important for keeping the community stable. Uh, if it gets unbalanced, that could cause ripple effects throughout the entire um, community. But so sort of things that are important here are sort of the delayed effect of the sort of the gazelle spiking and then the lion spiking, and sort of the importance of this sort of equilibrium between the predator and the prey, which keeps the entire community um, stable. Ah, so here is where sort of we are supposed to put that. Um, but I guess the point is, is that sort of predator-prey relationships, they, they need to exist at some sort of equilibrium with this continuous sort of cycling of sort of spiking of gazelle and then spiking of lions. Um, if not, if, for example, um, the lions sort of to grow out of control for some reason, the gazelle can go down in population. And then what eats the gazelle won't have anything, or what, what I'm sorry, what, um, and then the, the lions won't have anything else left to eat um, if all the gazelle go down. Similarly, um, if for some reason the gazelle um, or the, the, the gazelle spikes, um, then the gazelle, because it's not being controlled by the lions anymore, um, whatever the gazelle eats, eats will go down. Um, so this sort of relationship between the lions and the gazelle, sort of this constant equilibrium, is important to keep the entire community stable. Um, so for the sort of last part of this lesson, and it's actually one more part of that you keep on saying, the last part. We're going to focus on sort of adaptations of predator and prey um, to sort of prevent from the prey not eat, but being eaten by the predator. Prey sort of adapt um, to avoid being eaten by the pre a predator, and then the predator adapts along with the prey. Um, that idea is called co-evolution. So the prey adapts to escape the predator, and the predator adapts so it can re-get the prey um, in that case. Um, so it's sort of a natural selection at action. If the prey doesn't adjust ways to escape the predator, it may eventually be eliminated from the population. Um, so next we're going to sort of look at look at adaptations of prey um, that they sort of evolve to be able to escape the predator. Um, so some examples. So along along crawl, crawls, there are some organisms, particularly some some types of uh, squirrels, um, that they sort of they develop. Uh, alarms or calls that they sort of release when predators are in the environment to warn sort of their family members um, that that predators are near. Um, there's also sort of camouflage, which we're going to look at examples of that in a second. Um, some organisms, when they're in the in the presence of, of predators, will release toxins that are poisonous um, to the predator. And then we have sort of two types of mimicry um, that we're going to look at. Um, and we're not really going to focus on the difference between these two, to be honest, which was important in the other um, course. Um, but um, we're just going to look at an example of mimicry. So one of the first examples of uh, adaptations that prey have developed to, ex to um, escape prey is camouflage. 
Um, and you can sort of see in these instances, the organism blends in with its environment. And I'm sure in your black and white copy, you can barely see the organisms. But here, there's a bird, and here there's a lizard, here there's a toad, here there's a frog, and here there's a lizard. They develop colorations that allow them to blend into their environment and, mess and make them less likely to be seen um, by prey. Um, another example of um, adaptations that prey have developed is sort of warning colorations. Um, sort of organisms that are poisonous tend to be colorful, uh, and this sort of signals um, for the prey that you shouldn't eat me because I'm poisonous. Um, and some organisms have developed sort of the ability to avoid eating organisms that appear colorful um, because they know that they are poisonous. So here we have a poisonous frog, poisonous caterpillars, poisonous snakes. Um, so sort of warning coloration to tell the predator um, that, oh, I'm poisonous, so you shouldn't eat me. <laughs> Um, okay, and last, but not, we're going to take an example of mimicry. Um, and there's a type of mimicry called Bastillian mimicry, where a organism that is not harmful mimics a harmful species um, so that the organism that eats it avoids it. So here, um, if we take a look, we have a green parrot snake, which is dangerous um, and poisonous. And here we have a hawk moth uh, larva, which is eaten by birds. Um, here, the hawk, the hawk moth lover is mimicking the green parrot snake. Um, in this way, it appears dangerous to birds, and birds will avoid trying to eat it. Um, so it's sort of mimicking something that's harmful, so its actual prey, I'm sorry, its actual predator will avoid it, thinking it's actually the green um, parrot snake um, in that case. So there are two more things um, that we're going to discuss in the idea of community ecology. Um, the first one um, is the importance of community diversity. Um, the more diverse a community is, um, the more likely it will be able to survive disturbances. Um, if we take a look at the um, example here, community one is more diverse than community two because it composes sort of different, more different types of organisms. The more organisms that can fulfill a role, the more likely the community is to survive. So for example, if there are many lizards that eat insects, if one of the lizards were to go extinct, one of the other lizards can come and take its, take its role of controlling the insect population. But the more organisms that, can, organisms that can sort of fill in roles in the community or take over a role in the community, um, the more stable the community is and the more likely the community will survive um, in that case. So it almost you think about the pathways. If 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 um one if, if someone was to leave the pathways community, if there's another person in the community that can play that role, um, then community the, the the pathways community will remain stable. Um, in some cases, that's maybe the cause of some of the unstabilization of the pathways community. People have left, and others have not been able to fulfill that role, which has made the community a little bit unstable um, to some to some extent. Um, the last and final thing we need to talk about um, is an example of a keystone species in a community. Um, so a keystone species um, in a community is, is an organism that, that isn't maybe the most abundant in the community, but plays the most important role in maintaining the, the sort of stability um, of, the, of the community. Um, and the most common or classic example of a keystone species is the sea otter. Um, sea otters are cute, but they're actually not the nicest creatures in the world. Um, you can read some horrible things about sea otters. Um, but if we just sort of take a look um, at sort of this graph, which is a little bit confusing, um, but so the job of this is a food chain, and if you sort of, as you go up, the thing above it eats the thing below. So killer whales um, eat sea, sea otters, sea otters eat sea urchins, and then sea urchins eat kelp. And in this community, um, if the, it's the goal of the um, sort of sea otter to control um, the sea urchin population. Um, if for some reason it's not, if the sea urchin population grows out of control, um, the kelp get destroyed or completely eaten by the sea urchins. And the kelp are really, really important in the community um, because um, they, pr they provide, they do photosynthesis and provide all the food of the community. But it's really the job of the sea otter. The sea otter is in sort of the preeminent role, sort of controlling or keeping the entire community stable. Um, sort of if you look here at the um, graphs, there was a period of time um, in sort of this community where the sort of population of whales spiked. And that caused um, the sea otter abundance 
um, to go down, or almost be eliminated from the population. This in turn caused a spike in um, sea urchin population, um, which caused a extreme decrease um, in the amount of kelp. And this made the sort of community really unstable because the kelp um, were responsible here um, for making sort of all the food in the, in the ocean community because they're the, the producers of the community. They take the sun and do photosynthesis and make food. If they're completely eliminated, then what eventually happens is that the sea urchins, which sort of grew out of control and eliminated all the kelp, will have nothing to eat, which will make the sea otter will have nothing to eat, which will make the um, killer whale have nothing to eat, and then the entire community is destroyed. But they sort of saw that it was the sea otter population um, that was sort of key to the sort of their population, or keeping their population stable, was key to the survival of the entire community. Um, and that's what a keystone species is, sort of the most important organism, that if this organism is removed from the community, the rest of the community will become extremely um, unstable um, in that case. All right, so that is the end of the community ecology lesson. Um, you need to go answer the guided questions, and I will see you guys on Monday.